I continued to teach a course on the history of Western consciousness and in the experimental college at UC Davis and to explore that part of my interest. But then out of that exploration and the teaching came another project that became a major part of my life. I got back into the dualistic mode and I realized that part of Western consciousness is that we really do not have a good um, awareness of how we actually physically relate to the earth and our environment. And so that idea of um, what used to be, you know, going and driving for many miles or even flying to India to sit, you know, in a cave and um, contemplate nature, I realized that, hey, you know, flying to India back in the 1980s would have been in a 747 airliner in which um, the fuel consumption of each passenger is equivalent to each person, each passenger driving um, a Cadillac to India and back. Now that is a huge environmental impact. And, and so I began to look at that and embarked on a project to quantify that for individuals to allow to get people to become aware of how they impact the environment. I named the software, I renamed it Earth Aware when I ported it over to Windows 3.1. I developed these different um, rankings that uh, you can end up with depending on how many impact points and uh, advocacy points. Okay, so you, there were advocacy points. Um, some people thought that everything, you know, was carbon dioxide, but when you um, become aware of, say, um, the uh, extinction of various species, whether it's cactus plants or bird species uh, that are being uh, traded in the wildlife trade, um, unless they're cutting down rainforest for them, that, that has very little to do with uh, global warming and climate change. So there are these different, you know, very different dimensions in there. In developing the, uh, the Windows version, the EarthAware version, it was very early. The internet was, was very young. It was 1992 and 93. And uh, I, uh, the way I would solve problems, I, I used, because uh, you may remember we had these um, different, uh, well, I used CompuServe, which was, so we had AOL, America Online, CompuServe, and then there were several others that were these um, services that you could pay a small fee for. And just a bit of digital history here. This was not the internet, although I think the internet was functioning very early. This was the, the late, mid to late 1980s. We would uh, use these telephone modems and dial a certain number to connect to CompuServe. And then there would be, an, there was another number to connect to America Online, AOL. And so this is how we uh, uh, connected with those services before the internet really came on strong. Then a few years later, CompuServe and AOL and others migrated over to the internet and AOL became one of the, the ways that you could connect to the, the internet. And CompuServe had, had these programmers on there and it was really good. I mean, I've never had, it was like having, you know, professional paid uh, uh, consulting. I would ask a question almost every day uh, about programming. How do I do this? Or here's this problem I have with Visual Basic. And it would, um, so there were these different uh, categories that you could join. And, and one of them was Windows, you know, Visual Basic. And they would get back to me within 12 hours, these programmers, these guys who knew a lot. And so anyway, that was at the, you know, very early on. And, and uh, then I started to use the internet and there's still, I, I put in, um, as you go through EarthAware um, on each subject, say um, uh, consumerism or renewable energy, I, I put up some 
URLs into the program. And that was 25 years ago. So um, it would be uh, highly unusual if any of those are still there. But um, it is still downloadable and available. The EarthAware software that I originally developed in Windows 3.1 is available for download from CaliforniaBoomer.com. It did run on subsequent versions of Windows, Windows 98, Windows XP, as I recall. And then after that, I stopped trying it, but it should be able to run if you know how to do that kind of thing. Then there was a Macintosh version that I did. And I recently, I found the two of the 3.5 inch of what we called floppy disks for the Macintosh. And this was back in 1992, I guess. And I had someone port them over to text files. And those are also downloadable uh, on CaliforniaBoomer.com. I have no idea how you would run those on a Macintosh, but the Macintosh jocks might be able to do that. That Macintosh version would be very similar to the DOS version that I originally developed, and it was called Enviro Account. And that's what the Macintosh version is called. Uh, however, I've not uh, been able to find the code for the original DOS version that I wrote in the basic programming language. Traces. This is how the program runs with when the trace is on. It goes through each code, each line of code, and shows you what it's doing. Hey, Don. What are you doing there? Doing my work. <laughs> program. What's Personal up? Environmental Impact Analysis Program. Oh, this is your program, huh? So, um, How is it going? Slow. Slow? <laughs> what do you mean by slow? Uh, well, you have been working so hard. Yeah. Software uh, has an infinite number of uh, problems. Yeah. So this is how I work because uh, I like standing up. Is this your? Working. Is this all your stuff? Yeah. It's all my stuff. This is. Uh, I finished the EarthAware software, and I let it go out there. And I, it has never really done much uh, for three or four main reasons. Um, one, it was probably 25 years ahead of its time. Uh, it was pushing uphill to uh, get it um, taken up by the environment community and the climate change community. And which in the early and mid 1990s was mainly people like Al Gore and a few others. Um, secondly, I was and remain uh, more of a scientist uh, and scholar than I am a business person. And to get something like this out and successful and um, well established and perhaps you know purchased. Um, I needed to schmooze, I needed to connect with people, I needed to get out more, and I just, I'm still not very good at that. I work on what I want to do and what um, stimulates me, okay, my creative endeavors, and so I let it go at that. Um, and so the third uh, main reason was that I, I then came across the um, r reason to get back to my PhD, a, a new um, project that completely um, left behind the, uh, the biometeorology and the, um, the agroforestry bio biometeorology projects that I had attempted uh, during the, you know, the time when there was little funding. Um, but I, I, later in this video, I'll talk about my, my eventual PhD research on the uh, wine, uh, in the wine country, on vineyards, and their ability, the ability of organically managed vineyards to resist 
the phylloxera insect, um, the infestation of, and the decline of a vineyards and the ability of organically managed vineyards to resist that. And so um, I went on to other things and the uh, I put up the Earthaware software to, to uh, onto my website. It's still there. I haven't had time to really look at it, but I, I believe it still runs on Windows and it's on my website, downloadable. In the winter of 1988-89, all six uh, lotters went back to Malawi for a 25-year reunion of our experience in the Peace Corps there. One of the things that I recall about that trip was how positive so many of the Malawians were about the Peace Corps having uh, been there. So just for instance, the captain of the, uh, the ship that I will show uh, the Lala going, goes up and down the lake, said, oh, my best teacher was a Peace Corps volunteer, and he knew her name, Janie something. And that was just a great experience to hear that from so many of the the leaders and the people who went on to to um, put, you know, to lead that country. <laughs> Ray's taking the bear off. Huh? Well, Tell Ray what's right true. Here, Morning. Morning, Mike. Morning, Mike. You want to take one with Mike? Yeah. Well, that yeah, camera's you know. sure been around the world many times, hasn't yeah. it? Okay, here. Keep it on infinity. I know, but you don't turn it, you push it. Money Bumbo. Money Bumbo. <laughs> 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 in very low light down. In fact, it enhances. I rented a room in about 19, starting about 1994, 95 with Larry Fisher. Larry is a still over 30 years later, a dumpster diver. And I still eat great food that he salvages and brings to me. He knows how to do it. He's been doing it for 40 years. And I, I think about over half of the value of my food because it's so much uh so much of it is he brings his meat and valuable stuff i still eat 
and here are photos of just some of the things that Larry brings. All of my, most of my eggs, uh, all of my meat, uh, fish, salmon, beautiful salmon uh, from the, uh, the, the sushi places, toss. And he knows, you know, the people there, he knows how to get it cold, but they take the choice cuts for their sushi and then they toss this um, stuff that has bones and fins, but it's full of meat, long ropes of meat, long pieces of meat with the stomach fat, beautiful stuff. And so I make a curry, um, <clears throat> I make a salmon curry and eat that about three times a week. So Larry also salvages uh, just stuff from everywhere, from alleyways, uh, from the, uh, when he goes over to take stuff to the, uh, the metal, re to the recycling at, uh, Recology, uh, he, he salvages stuff from the metal recycling bin, and, uh, so I have a video, I've sped it up to show his yard, and so I have traditionally before going to the hardware store to get stuff. I'll make a Larry list. Of, and, and if I have 10 things like nails and string and tape and a tool and this and that, I can often get almost the entire list uh, at Larry's house. Larry also uh, takes these items that he has salvaged and uh, I guess he calls it... Uh, well, he reuses them, he re remakes them, he makes them into new tools and things. And so he's shown here with a, a garden tool that he's made out of, I think, a leaf spring. So during this academic downtime, I uh, went and got a job at a local video store. And recently I was talking with my brothers, one of whom is a, a, um, owns a, a cinema in a, a small city in California. And and uh, so we talk movies a lot because he's been, he goes every year to the big event in Las Vegas for the cinema uh, industry. And so we got talking about The Godfather and I remembered a lot of scenes from it and was explaining to the guys about Michael Corleone and Freddie Corleone. And they, they were wondering how I knew so much and I realized it was because I worked at the video store there uh, on 8th Street that the uh, Korean, this Korean guy owned, and Jeff Hefner, who was a local musician and who I'd gotten to know at Slater's Court, uh, was uh, was working there and, and, you know, got me hired. And so Jeff and I worked together in the afternoons, and uh, he was very interested in becoming a cameraman or a, a grip or, you know, whatever those best boy or something um he was he was going to go down to hollywood and he was studying how to how to do that camera work i guess he was taking classes and stuff and um he used to play the godfather the entire time that we worked it was just repeated he would go through first second third and so i realized that's why i knew uh i know so much about the godfather because i've seen it a number of times the Korean owner was a real skinflint, and um, oh, I'm just you know this was twenty almost twenty five years ago, so I'm not remembering his name. But his wife used to come in once in a while, and she would when he was back you know in the back room doing something, he would she would slip us money you know twenty dollar bill each. I was saying oh you know, um, and he used to get mad at her. He used to catch her doing that. Yeah, she was a real nice lady. Every video store back then had a kind of a section in the back that uh, was kind of, you know, you would walk into this separate room or, or, you know, it was boarded off and it was for the adult uh, movies, uh, you know, uh, videotapes. And so I just remember uh, a professor coming in, a certain professor, and I was just used to being friendly with everybody. I didn't really, I never even worked. You know, they didn't ever have me working back there. It was always uh, the owner who did all that, and or, or Jeff. And so uh, I just remember, oh, hi, Professor So and So. And he goes, how do you know who I am? Because he was renting, he was renting um, some uh, adult uh, 
films. Um, and so, yeah, I wasn't supposed to do that. I won't divulge the name of the well-known professor. My qualifying exam was an oral exam and uh, it's much more, um, well, for some people, terrifying. But scary, because five uh, professors, five full professors. Getting five professors together in one room at the same time is really, it, it must be impossible now. Um, but uh, it's probably all done by Zoom. But um, back then, we had to schedule them. And each one takes, oh, 30 minutes or so and asks questions. Two and a half hours, two hours later, they had me go sit outside. Uh, I sat for 15 minutes. They called me in and said, congratulations, we passed you. Oof, boy. I made trips to the east side of the Sierra Nevada mountains uh, in California, uh, over on the Nevada side remained a, a great uh, you know escape for me i have uh, i had friends who i still have who would um organize these trips right uh, during the you know the cold season during the winter and very early spring we'd go over and i was i would be you know so busy getting ready for my oral exams and this and that that uh, they would say oh, you know marcus uh, and his girlfriend later wife liz I'd say, Don, just put together a few things. We'll take care of everything. We're just going to pass by. We're going to roll you into the van. They had an old, a good old split window uh, VW van that they still have. And we would go over and, and do the hot springs on the east side. These are still my friends. Marcus and Liz now have a, uh, a winery. They grow the grapes. Uh, Marcus worked for a, a big uh, grape uh vine nursery for a long time and learned that trade and then went to Spain and very early on about I think probably 15 or 20 years ago bought uh, the Spanish uh, varietals of, uh, of of grape that they've been the Spanish have been growing just as long as the you know French and, and he's growing them and making them into wine and has become quite successful with Bokish uh, winery. On one of our trips we we're going right after it snowed to out to see a ghost town on the Nevada side, and it, it was it involved a long, you know, ten mile dirt road, uh, freshly covered with about six inches of snow, and so we were in the split window van and we hit a a a uh, a drain. I guess it was a drain, a kind of a, a canal, uh, and just you know, it made a big bump, and and we went on and visited the town and then on the way back the the vw van uh engine blew up and we, all the guys the guys were in other vans vw vw vans and they gathered around uh and assessed that the uh the bump had uh which is kind of typical of these old uh vws uh the lurching and the the bump had smashed and crimped the uh, exhaust pipe and so the exhaust backed up uh, and heated up until the engine blew and so these guys just got it together we all got down to town they delivered me back to my house and then went bought all the parts uh, for uh, no let's see I guess they towed the van they, they towed the van down to um, where they live most mostly around you know Lincoln and place like that and uh and rebuilt the engine themselves and got back on the road they didn't <laughs> didn't worry about it a bit it was so these guys lived at um slater's court they they uh so it was uh john bomar marcus bokish uh coy Ware, and um they uh lived in one of the, the small houses that could could hold three people this is back in the 80s and that's how I got to know them. Harbin Hot Spring was a whole other deal. It was a um, a really, I think it was well run place because uh, they had a beautiful setting and uh, this hot water that came out right in in the hills uh, uh, there in um, 
sort of northern northwest of Davis. There were no highways going up that direction. You had to go through the wine country and and some hilly country to get there. And they it, it was run by uh, an organization that uh, was registered as a church, and they kept it. You know, you, so you when you went, you paid. You know, back then in the 80s and 90s, you'd pay ten dollars a day, which was really reasonable. Because the other place, uh, there was a another hot spring called Wilbur that was really way too expensive, and it was, um, you know, so I never did go to that. But you could go to Harbin, and then you could park and and camp. You you know, when you paid, you paid to camp, or you could pay for a bunk in the bunkhouse, and then they had a very large kitchen where you could do your own food and it was it was really quite nice and and um so if you could get used to um all of the sort of new age nudity you you could have a good experience some people just can't handle that i know that <laughs> when i came back from costa rica uh the latin americans just uh, don't do that stuff it, it it's the opposite end of the spectrum from the latin american culture it's kind of interesting because I did, um, you know, I did, one of my pastimes was to do, was to dance uh, salsa and go to the salsa clubs, salsa dance clubs. And the Latin Americans, you know, they have a, a really nice ritual. Uh, you know, this is especially the Colombians and the Cubans and and then many other Latin Spanish-speaking countries uh, took, took up as well. Uh, the salsa dance where it was sanctioned for you to um, to hold a woman very close and you know you're, you're touching you're you're really you're really quite close and you could always do one dance with a woman who you didn't know uh, and then there was kind of a um, I guess a protocol where if you you know danced more than once then it you know it meant more uh, but um, it was a really nice way to get close and and to get this this touching and get to know someone and yet the Latin Americans just you know when I got back from uh, my Costa Rica trip uh, the um, it was a real culture shock to go to Harbin hot spring and I had to and it, I think it is for a lot of people but all you, you just have to sort of ignore all the, the the nudity uh some people go there for you know to find sexual partners but um it's really against the rules to uh to pry or to be uh what you know what they call uh, a guy the guys who are called sharks who go after the women um and it it uh it was quite nice and you could always uh go during the times when there weren't many people in the warm pool there's a warm pool and a hot pool but later, um, in about 2011 or 12, they had a, during one of our drought years, the north wind came up uh, in the fall. And the north wind has never really blown hard in the fall part of the year here uh, because uh, it just hasn't been. But as a result of, of climate change, of global warming, uh, and I actually, you know, I, I, I researched this, these things, and, and found, you know, the evidence that they have that, that these, um, the, 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 the seas, the ocean off of uh, the coast of Korea and Japan warmed up enough that it caused these typhoons. And the typhoons would drive these high pressure, very high pressure fronts, which is what brings our dry north wind into uh, to California uh, in the fall when things are tender, dry. And that wind was blowing 40, 50 miles per hour, dry right through the forest and, and any fire just uh, took off. And it blew so hard it, it burned up uh, Harbin Hot Spring, these beautiful buildings, hand made uh, wooden buildings, especially I remember this one that was for yoga um, and it had these curves and lines and all this innovative kinds of buildings were just uh, burned to the ground and they they now have uh, put together, I don't know, some kind of, you know, I, I think it has reopened, but it's probably more expensive now. So that issue of the north wind blowing during the fall months when things are tinder dry has persisted. Uh, not every year, but uh, it, it is one of the climate changes that we have seen uh, that result from global warming. 
I met Elsa Bressler in the local, one of the local used bookstores, Bogey's Books, right down uh, town near the Roma Cafe, and fell in love, and we were married within a couple of years. Um, Elsa grew up, did, did the main part of her growing up in Tuscany, Italy, and speaks uh, fluent Florentine uh, Italian, uh, and also uh, does wonderful cooking and uh, dinner presentations of the uh, the Tuscan food. I moved to Vancouver, and when I after I finished my PhD. Uh, in the year 2000 and uh, lived there. Our, our marriage only lasted a couple of years, but we uh, remain uh, good friends. Uh, Elsa, I'm in touch with her. We, we have health issues that make our mobility about the same. Elsa has gone through cancer uh, and is still getting the uh, um, therapy, the chemo and radiation therapy and the different uh, uh, drugs that they have to deal with cancer. Um, and so she's, her mobility is not much more than mine, uh, but she's my best friend and I am going up to see her, or the Grand Princess. We talk movies a lot. Uh, Elsa is a movie buff and it's kind of remarkable how she can remember all of the different uh, directors of, of movies. Tell me about the Germans. In Germany here, the books are perfect. <laughs> what did your cat do when it came in? When it, when it ran well, in? It was going around and... and <laughs> It was going around and figure eights being chased by this cat and then finally kind of got him to run into the house and flew back to the back room and it <laughs> vomited. <laughs> the legendary 1976 Paris wine tasting that a British wine merchant set up to compare the California wines with the French wines uh, put California wines on the map because the California wines came out on top in both the reds and the whites. The French wine professionals, of course, being French, tried to have the results nullified. All told in a movie entitled Bottle Shock. The grapes for those California wines were very likely grown on, whether it was Chardonnay or Cabernet Sauvignon, on the AXR1 rootstock. The AXR1 rootstock was um, the one that was chosen. It was actually selected by a man who lived around the corner from Sunset Court by the name of Loy Leiter. He was the agricultural extension guy, along with one other University of California um, agricultural extension agent. They chose AXR1 because it, it performed so well. Um, it um, had all the characteristics of a rootstock that um, was well adapted. It gave good, you know, yields of grapes. It didn't give too much vegetative growth. It had some resistance to drought and some resistance to flooding and all these kinds of things that they were looking for. And so this rootstock um, was recommended by uh, the UC extension agents and the nurseries, the vineyard nurseries. When they when they do these, uh, you know, they 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 graft the scion to the rootstock, you know, whether it's Cabernet or Zinfandel or or uh, uh, Chardonnay or whatever varietal of grape, they they graft it to the rootstock, and this was done by the tens of thousands. And so um, into the 80s, we go with California wine industry booming, still booming, or was in the last decade anyway, even in the 2000s. Um, but uh, 
a little bit now about the phylloxera insect. Here's a grapevine story that went around back in the 90s. The French being the French, of course, um, there's another story of the French coming to the Americans saying, we are going to charge a certain uh, uh, price per vine of French varietal grapes, such as Cabernet Sauvignon and uh, Chardonnay, etc. And the Americans went, you know, back to the drawing board and came back with a counter proposal. Okay, we are going to charge you the same amount for every North American rootstock you are using, um, of which all of the French varieties are being grown on phylloxera resistant North American vitis species rootstock. And so they didn't hear anything about it after that. The grape phylloxera is, it's, it's called the root aphid. I don't know, that, I can't remember whether it's related to aphid, but the um, the French came over in the early 1800s and, uh, uh, to the United States where we have some, at least a dozen native uh, vitis uh, uh, species of grape, the North American grape. And of course, the European grape that uh, all of the, nearly all of the wines are uh, made from is vitis vinifera. So back in the 18, early 1800s, these French um, horticulturists came over and they brought back to Europe these um, plants, these Native American um, species of vitis. Well, um, indigenous and native to the, some of the North American vitis uh, uh, grapes was the, the phylloxera insect. And so they brought that back as well. And by the mid 1800s, I'm not you you know you can look it up, but the um, the French and the European, uh, the, mainly the French wine industry, had been decimated by the spread of the phylloxera, and so you know wine prices went up, and it was a big crisis. All right, so fast forward to California. The AXR1 rootstock was um, tested against the phylloxera that they knew existed in California and was shown to be resistant. However, there was a little bit of what they called vitis vinifera blood in the AXR1 rootstock. Okay, so there was some genetic stock, there was the original AXR1 uh, grapevine that they used as a rootstock had some vitis vinifera, um, some small amount of, of heritage. And so what happened was the phylloxera, uh, if you have tens and tens and tens of thousands of vines being exposed to phylloxera, you get um, this, uh, what they call uh, heavy selection pressure for a phylloxera uh, biotype that is, um, that uh, can survive and feed on the AXR1 rootstock, which is what happened. And so the, so the biotype B, as in the letter B, um, uh, type of, of phylloxera spread all through California during the 1980s and into the 1990s, and vineyards were declining. And uh, so by the 1990s, I had read and, and heard from organic um, vineyard management managers, okay, managers, uh, organic farmers who were growing their uh, grapes organically, that the, uh, the AXR1 rootstock and the, the grapes were not uh, succumbing to the grape phylloxera. They had bought their you know their vines from the vineyards from the uh, nurseries that uh, sold them all on you know the xr1 rootstock a few on uh the what they call own rooted uh vines in other words the cabernet or the chardonnay uh grapevine grown on its own roots and apparently in chile 
uh, all of the cabs and the wines are grown on own on, it's on their own rootstocks. And the word was a couple of decades ago that they had they just did not have phylloxera. I'll have to look that up. So I put together um, in about 1996-97 a proposal to to do research on that to look. I, I, there was enough anecdotal evidence that these uh, organically managed vineyards were uh, uh, resistant to to the decline. They were not declining, um, uh, at least, uh, they, well, the word was they were not declining to the phylloxera. The phylo and, of course, the phylloxera, uh, the decline is from the, the root rot, and so, um, which I show in, in these slides here, the native um, soil uh, uh, root pathogens that are every soil has a few uh, spores of of the um, root pathogens like fusarium and pythium and these other uh, root pathogens and when they encounter a damaged root the um, because the phylloxera causes these roots to um, gall they, they form galls and and split uh, the the uh, outer epidermis of the the, the root um, splits in and these uh, fungal pathogens can get inside so my research was to uh, collect roots uh, of phylloxera infested vines from both organic and uh, non-organic what we call conventional vineyards that were of the same variety, the same, you know, in similar places at similar soils, and, um, and then look at the, uh, the damage caused by the phylloxera. And so what I found was that, that the um, organically managed vineyards had roots that were, you know, they were declining uh, much more slowly. They did actually eventually decline, um, and they, uh, the vineyardists tried to replicate what I did, but um, they didn't keep in mind that it really takes many years of organic management to build up this resistance. This, the, um, a lot of it was the, the beneficial um, organisms in the soil from, the, uh, from disking in large uh, amounts of cover crop and applying composts and not applying the um, the herbicides and things the uh, uh, the organically managed vines were more had more resistance they had the 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 defense compounds that could produce but it was also that the um, the roots in these organically managed uh, vines and vineyards uh, were also covered with you know, had all of these beneficial types of, of, of um, fung fungi uh, that uh, that live and and uh, propagate in soils that have a lot of organic matter uh, put into them. Species like Trichoderma. This is all 25 years old for me, so I'm <laughs> I'm trying to remember back uh, these things. But the beneficial um, uh, fungal species as well as bacterial species were important because they were they would sort of surround the root uh, protect the root from the fungal pathogens. I later wrote at least one article and did a little bit of speaking on this um, subject of, of um, the defense compounds of these uh, vines that had to defend themselves against fungal pathogens against the uh, the mildews, the downy mildew, the um, powdery mildew, the um, they had to produce the defense compounds and the defense compounds are actually turn out to be uh, the components of, of, many of them are the components of wine quality, some of the, the flavonoids and resveratrol and things like that. I did ask myself why back in the mid 1800s when everything was organically grown they didn't have um, the, uh, the the herbicides and pesticides that we have these days but in but in fact they did the French had come up with a copper um, compound called known as the Bordeaux mixture 
and they were putting huge amounts of it onto the vines to um, to keep uh, powdery mildew and downy mildew from uh, reducing the, the vine growth. And that copper went into the soil, and copper is is a um, is very disruptive um, and lethal to to fungi. So it would have um, pretty it would have disrupted the soils. And I I did try to look for some research on that. There has been some, but uh, by this time it was I was beyond you know I had I had finished this work. So. That's the story. I did, you know, some of the vineyards I went to, the vineyard owners were really angry at the University of California for recommending the AXR1 rootstock. But everyone I talked to um, said that the AXR1 is an excellent rootstock and made really, it uh, grew the vines really well, better than anything else. And so that's why it was, um, it was uh, used and recommended by the University of California. Okay, so there's more to the story of the wines. Back in 2004, there was a wine tasting, a blind tasting set up uh, for professional uh, wine tasters to taste um, and compare wines grown via bio biodynamic uh, methods uh, compared to uh, conventional measures. Now, they, this was very well set up because these were, these wines were paired because they were um, the same varietal from uh, as close to each other as they could get. So they they found a biodynamic winery, uh, vineyard winery, and then uh, found uh, a one that was not biodynamic nor organic, just conventional, um, to compare. And so they did this with 10 pairs of wines. Now, biodynamics um, is actually a, a version of organic. It's, some people call it super organic, uh, that was developed by Rudolf Steiner way back a um, hundred years ago, developer of the Waldorf school system and biodynamic agriculture and Eurythmy dance and some you know, other things. Steiner came up with very specific uh, formulas for making compost that would pull in, um, I guess what he called cosmic energy or the astral energy of the, the stars. And, um, and so the, um, the vineyards that were being biodynamically managed, I think mostly they were using this uh, preparation 501 in which um, cow manure uh, is mixed with some herbs and with silica, powdered silica, you know, just ground up sand, I think, uh, or quartz, um, not sure what, but silica anyway. And then that stag horn, and it's just, you, you can't put very much into, a, into the horn, a cow's horn, um, and then is buried for a certain amount of time and then taken out and um, then put into a uh, certain water, I'm sure it has to be very pure water, not tap water, and then um, that preparation has to be stirred in a certain direction to quote invoke and pull in the cosmic energies. And then that is sprayed onto the, uh, the vines in the vineyard, the biodynamically grown vines. And so along with a, a lot of other, you know, basically organic practices like using cover crops and com and and large amounts, you know, and, and composts applied. Um, the biodynamic methods basically are a type of super organic. Um, in other words, the, the, the main, uh, as I described before and showed in my research, it's really the, the, the very high inputs of, um, of carbon, okay, of organic matter, cover crops, disked in that feeds what we now call a, 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 a microbiome, a soil microbiome. And that, that term is now, I guess, we've been using that for about 10 years. Uh, a number of, you know, so all uh, uh, it, um, the energy, the, 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 the carbon energy feeds an entire food web there in the soil, uh, many of which are beneficial um, fungi, beneficial bacteria, nematodes, all sorts of things that feed on and prevent the, um, 
the foliar the, the pathogens uh, from from uh, invading the roots. Also, um, it's been shown that silica has a an effect of inducing systemic resistance, and so um, there may be some science to these preparations, even if it's just a small amount. It only takes a small amount of silica. Um, and so I write about this in, in an article that I wrote for a, an online magazine that I think, I don't know whether it exists anymore, but Organic uh, Wine Journal, I think. Um, so, anyway, this tasting, in this taste, this blind tasting, the wines that were produced in biodynamic, uh, uh, managed vineyards uh, were judged superior in the blind tasting in eight of the ten pairs of wines. One was neutral and, and one in, there was one in which the conventional was judged superior. Of course, this depends on the winemaker and everything. So, but this was a, this was a result that's um, a watershed event, just like the 1976 Paris wine tasting was for California wines. And so, um, fast forward to the 2000s, and, you know, you know, 2005, this was 2004, it came out, and then 2005 to, say, 2015 or 2010, imagine the, 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 you have these vineyards owned by very wealthy uh, people coming from all over the United States, retired executives, retired uh, lawyers, surgeons, and whatnot, and they want their uh, vineyard managed biodynamically. And so you can just imagine that this vineyard has had a vineyard manager, a guy, you know, wearing a, a baseball cap and has probably a redneck and and um, driving a pickup. I'm not being disparaging here at all. Um, there are times when I've had a redneck. Um, but anyway, just imagine this guy, you know, and he's got the, the fuel tank in the back of his pickup and all the stuff. And they say, um, look, we, we want you to, um, we, we're going to start managing this. Uh, vineyard biodynamically, do you want to stay with us? You know, this guy who's been there maybe 10 years, 20 years, and his guy is, he's, you know, he's got his salary and his life settled around that, that group of vineyards. And he says, yes. Okay, so now imagine this guy having to make these um, compost teas, these preparations, in which he gets a, the horn of a cow, puts manure in it, and some, you know, just follows all the the, the formula the directions that are detailed. Um, actually, I show a book here by M Maria Tun, who um, is the go-to person for biodynamics. And so this guy, he's doing all this stuff, and just you know, it was just hilarious to hear uh, some some of the vineyard managers at these conferences. Say, you know, these guys after they finish their day, they go to the bar, and they're sitting with other vineyard managers, all of whom are you know, conventional managers and they're spraying herbicides and all that on their vineyards and the guy's telling them, look, you know what I got to do? Uh, I got to, you know, put the manure in a, in a horn and bury it and then I got to wait 30 days and, and that when the moon is at, a, you know, this or that phase and I take it out and I have to, I put it into this water that I have to get from the creek that's absolutely pure water and I have to then stir this thing in a certain direction. Uh, and then use it to spray onto the, you know, and they're all over their beers, just, just, you know, laughing. But that was the upshot of the 2004 uh, tasting. Now, I haven't followed this whole situation, but what I imagine most of the, um, the vineyard uh, owners and managers have done is they have realized that it's really organic management that um, is giving this, although the the application of silica and the the uh, uh, the uh, initiation of um, systemic resistance using very small amounts of silica is um, plausible. So anyway, I wrote about this in this article, and it's available on my website under the under publications. Um, there was a, a young guy who started, I think, called the Organic Wine Journal. I don't think it lasted very long, but it's still up on the web. It's still there, and um, so you can, um, you can read that. I discuss this issue of systemic resistance, um, uh, causing the production of, uh, plant defense compounds that are, that turn out to be, 
um, wine quality components. So those of you, you know, the people who are very religious might say, well, God, you know, made the plant, you know, to uh, have the plant make resveratrol so that, it, you know, we could have better heart health. But those of us who are uh, more evolutionary minded uh, and physiological and scientific see that, you know, it's, it's really the defense compounds that count here. So that's the story on biodynamic wine. Now, biodynamic agriculture is certified by an organization known as Demeter, and they actually predate the organized organic. Um, organized organic, I think, didn't come really come out until, well, it really didn't get going until after World War II. It's, it's very interesting, though, um, and in my teaching you know, of biology, I, I go into this, that the origins of organic uh, farming and organic gardening are from uh, World War One, because the um, for World War One just before that, German uh, uh, scientists had developed the the uh, method um, the Haber Bosch method of uh, fixing nitrogen um, industrially, and before that all of the uh, the nitrogen for agriculture and uh, for explosives was uh, manufactured in some other way or, or uh, gotten from bat guano, very large um, deposits of bat guano, uh, you know, that has nitrates um, off, you know, in Chile and islands off of the coast of Chile. Um, but the, the, um, the invention of the Haber-Bosch uh, uh, um, method for fixing nitrogen because bef before this nitrogen is all fixed by the roots of legume plants uh, in which they have a uh, symbiotic relationship with bacteria that um, that actually uh, fix nitrogen from the atmosphere and it takes uh, a very large amount of it takes a lot of energy to break the the nitrogen nitrogen bond and so the plant provides these uh, rhizobial, rhizobium bacteria with uh, energy, with, with the energy and the rhizobia, then um, you know, break apart the nitrogen and turn it into ammonia and nitrate for the plant to use. And so legume plants had been, before this, the main source of, uh, the, the source of nitrogen for all of biological systems. Um, but with World War I, the other thing is that it's um, f the nitrogen, fixed nitrogen, in other words, ammonia and nitrates are needed uh, for explosives. And so thousands of factories then uh, were, were um, built uh, around the world in the industrialized countries, um, Germany, France, Britain, Japan, uh, the United States, Russia, um, for uh, um, production of nitrates, and so when when World War One ended, the um, uh, they had these thousands of factories all over the world. And what do they do with them? Well, they realized, hey, nitrogen is the main nutrient that plants need, and you could, um, if you could, uh, produce nitrogen and sell it as a bag of nitrate fertilizer, then a farmer, man or woman, could carry this bag of, of synthetic fertilizer on his or her shoulder out to the field, and it would have the same, basically the same effect uh, on these soils that had been organic for so many years, basically the same growth effect as an entire wagon load of manure, because the uh, this, the bags of fertilizer, you see, they're, they're labeled 20 0, 0 or 20 10 0 or 20 20 20. That's N, P, and K, okay, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Those are the big three nutrients that drive the production of, of plants. And so many farmers just started using these uh, synthetic fertilizers and putting them. And a number of people, such as Rudolf Steiner and, and oh, a dozen other um, uh, farmers and biologists from uh, the uh, Eve Balfour in Britain to 
uh, Rodale, the original uh, Rodale in the United States, to I think it was a guy named Ozawa in Japan. There was guys in Russia. They all realized that the the um, organic the inputs of carbon are so important to these soils that, because it gives a living soil. And so I've shown this book before, the book by E. Balfour, the uh, the wife of of <laughs> the guy who who uh, signed the Balfour Declaration that, um, well, that's a whole other thing in the Middle East. Anyway, um, uh, so the organic movement was born. And not only was it the synthetic nitrogen that uh, was the, the driver of this, but the chemical warfare, um, the, the, uh, the phosphor, especially the phosphorus um, chemicals that were used as uh, uh, in chemical warfare, those were transitioned into, uh, you know, the, the factories were transitioned into making insecticides. And so we get uh, most of our, or a lot of our industrial agriculture, uh, conventional agriculture from uh, the roots in, in war. And so it wasn't until after World War II that organics really took off and you, you had various um, organic proponents, and I ended up working at the Rodale Institute, which I will talk about um, in a bit, and um, as as part of my postdoc. Uh, and then in the next um, chapter of this, these videos, I'm going to talk about my journalism for their their short-lived magazine known as New Farm, the New Farm, and I did. Uh, they paid me to do stories uh, on organic farmers from. Quebec all the way across driving across Canada and each province to British Columbia and then all the way down in the state of Washington Oregon all through California through Mexico down to Guatemala Costa Rica and then over to Cuba I, I show these um, uh, I show you these stories and they're all uh, on my available on my webpage from organic uh, coffee in Costa Rica to organic uh, flax and uh, the like in Saskatchewan, uh, a number of stories there. So I guess I should tell the story, you know, fast forward to the 1990s. And actually it was the 1980s. It was very early on in the organic movement. The, the, um, we had certification systems by California Certified Organic Farmers, CCOF, and it wasn't until the 90s that the USDA uh, pretty much took that over um, when they tried to uh, say that genetically engineered foods should be uh, able to be certified as organic. They, they got the, most, the, the largest number of letters and cards in their history, a quarter of a million, saying, no, do not, the, the original you know, uh, organic uh, rules need to be followed. And so the USDA now, um, they approve, oh, probably a dozen different uh, certification agencies. These certification agencies, I know some of the uh, people in the CCOF, they have inspectors and they go out to the farms. They mostly inspect the books. Um, and then I'm not sure how much testing they do for pesticides. They learn uh, to have an eye for uh, for things that if there are break, uh, any rules being broken. Um, back in the 1970s when we were starting the student farm and there was a class that I was more involved in uh, called Alternatives in Agriculture, which apparently is still being taught. And um, we used to have guest speakers and we had this one guy, uh, Howard Beeman, who was known as a very quirky guy, uh, but he was one of the first organic farmers in Yolo County near, you know, where Davis is. And he came in and talked about his his plants, and we did this with different organic farmers. The bottom line was that my plants are resistant, are vi the vitality that they have, and so it was sort of bio biodynamic speak, even though he wasn't a biodynamic farmer. My plants have this vitality, uh, and they don't uh, get, I don't get infestations of aphids that my neighbors get on the same crop. I don't get the uh, powdery mildew or this or that disease. Um, because my plants have this vitality. And our professors, you know, one or two of them either were there 
or they, they looked in, and this is still the old guard, where they're, they're, the ag professors were, were, a lot of them were old farm boys. By these guys, Bob Loomis and Bill Rains, and good guys, these are, these are good people, but they just ridiculed. They called it voodoo agriculture. They ridiculed us. And, and um, it was just, you know, they laugh and they would, you know, say, oh, look at what he's doing. They're putting this, you know, manure in a stag's horn and doing this and that and just black magic and all that. Well, fast forward uh, 25, you know, 20 years, 25 years to uh, the lab I was in. And it turns out that, you know, they were finding that uh, organic methods with all of the, uh, the the organic matter, such as cover crops going into the soil and composts, which are actually a form of organic matter that is transformed by uh, microorganisms. Uh, the application of compost actually induces systemic resistance and this uh, resistance to diseases and pests like aphids. And so, you know, these, so it was a vindication. It was a vindication of these organic farmers um, you know, 25 years later, of course, the, um, the old guard ag professors had all retired and the new crop, um, you know, perhaps not half of them uh, were open to uh, doing the science of organic farming. And so my PhD was one of the first um, PhDs at the University of California, Davis, that had the word organic in it. Uh, you know, uh, from organic management as, as in organic farming. Um, and so that is uh, kind of, uh, I think, uh, an interesting story to tell. I think probably what has happened um, after about 2010, 2012, was that many of these um, bio biodynamic uh, vineyards transitioned to just being uh, garden variety organically certified because uh, the inputs of the uh, the organic matter and these things all um, were uh, the things that really count. And so you see a number of, of wines that uh, say that they produced from grapes uh, grown organically, but they don't say organic wine because the uh, certification body uh, that decides these things made the decision that uh, organic wines have to have no added sulfites and nearly all of the uh, winemakers who I have talked to say a small amount of sulfite is critical to making really high quality wines and so you don't see organic wine as much as you see um, wines uh, from organically managed vineyards because of this issue of, of adding uh, a small amount of sulfites uh, to the uh, the fermenting wine to in order to control certain uh, microbes that grow uh, and and sort of contaminate the wine. After I had my dissertation signed off and my PhD done, I moved to Vancouver, well, where Elsa was in the summer of the year 2000 and I spent a year there uh, enjoying it. Um, Vancouver is a beautiful city. Elsa can't stand it because it lacks the culture that um, Toronto has, that Montreal has, that San Francisco has, that New York has. I really had a good, I found the uh, Grouse, Grouse Mountain uh, is a, I think it's 2,000 foot climb from where the bus um, line stops and there's a tram that goes up and down um, and and you could uh, hike up this trail and it was quite popular to time oneself uh, and I could just I got so I could just barely do it under an hour and it was all uh, a steep a pretty steep trail a lot of it stairs you know soil and uh, wood um, you know railroad ties stairs and stuff um, but I would do that probably twice a month, and it was a real, I would get up there completely soaked. I'd just carry a fanny pack with a, with basically a, a light sweater and some money. i get in there, and I could buy, you know, hot 
tea and something to eat and cool down and look at the view of Vancouver and then take the uh, the tram down and take the bus back uh, to North Van and then the the uh, the ferry across um, Vancouver Bay to Vancouver itself and the West End. I also would run around the um, or walk around the um, Stanley Park, which is a peninsula that goes out into the bay and uh, around there's a nice bicycling hiking uh, asphalt path that goes under the Lionsgate Bridge and comes back and I did that quite a bit. Vancouver is really nice for someone like me or Mike, who's, you know, really recreation oriented. You could uh, easily drive for an hour up to Mount Whistler where they had the 2010, let's see, what was it? Yeah, 2010 Olympic, uh, Winter Olympics. And they were already, uh, well, in a couple, two years after that, they had, you know, reserved that place. So I spent um, basically a year there. I had a bicycle. I, I did a lot of riding. I had discovered the internet was still young and I had a library. Um, you didn't have the really accomplished hackers pretty much hacking up, you know, the internet and invading people yet, um, badly anyway. And so I had uh, my University of California library card and I could, they had just put on um, all, you know, thousands and thousands of academic journals, uh, full text. And so I could do research right there at my computer. And it was very early in the whole process. Not very many people were doing that. And so I spent a lot of time writing a paper uh, called, uh, entitled Organic Agriculture, doing a review basically of organic agriculture and got, got it published in a journal, a peer reviewed journal. I also was doing <laughs> my, you know, following my bliss and starting, you know, sort of an internet website company. It was, you know, the year 2000. And again, I, um, you know, I didn't really know how, basically it was, it was to connect people all over the world using the index uh, of an atlas, basically the index of an atlas of every town and enabling people to connect from different places, basically what, what uh, Google Earth did, um, you know, years later. There's a great documentary on how a German art collective um, really designed the model. And um, I think it was on, it's on Netflix, it's a three-part series um, called, um, entitled something about code, um, uh, high-value code or something. Anyway, um, I was uh, I was trying to get that started. It was called something like connect us, you know, one word connect us. And I remember going to a um, to a a, um, a thing, a meeting of of entrepreneurs who were trying to get enjoying because that was before things really fell down, before the big balloon popped on internet investments. Um, if I'd been if I'd been fast enough and connected enough, I think I would have gotten, um, you know, a partner and, and uh, investment, but, you know, it just wasn't, wasn't me. <laughs> and um, I went to this meeting up in Vancouver and there was a, a, a woman, a young woman, who was proposing this people's, the sort of, um, they didn't have the word cloud-based yet, but basically internet cloud-based, popular-based en encyclopedia, and I'm pretty sure she was from Wikipedia. Um, I do remember that, but a number of people told me, uh, listen, you are trying to start an internet company. Canada is not the right place to be. Canadians are just too fiscally and culturally conservative. They don't stick out their necks like people do down in, in California and Silicon Valley. You should really go down there and do that. And so um, I did these two things. I was writing that paper. I, I would I had a routine where I would go to these cafes, really nice cafes there around um, uh, the west end of Vancouver uh, and false, what they call False Creek. I had my favorite cafes to go to and sit and they had Wi-Fi, um, which in the year 2000 was, you know, that was that was um, really good to have. And I could do all this research. I'd take my computer and write and I'd spend, gosh, two, three, four hours there, sometimes five and then um, walk back to the apartment, um, Elsa's apartment in the West End there. Um, 
we didn't have a car. Elsa has never owned a car, so she's um, in the Earth Aware jargon category. She's an eco titan, the very highest of the um, titles you can get with a score, because basically cars were the biggest thing that uh, would uh, pile up your impact points. I ended up riding a bike over to where they were, uh, there was a small group, a small business starting of um, doing uh, fresh fruit and vegetable baskets uh, known as a community supported agriculture. And, you know, so I was hired, you know, I got some money to go out to go door to door and was paid for how many people subscribed. And that was right during the winter. I remember riding my bike over in the rain and the sleet and the, and the slush. Um, over the bridge, the Burrard Bridge, uh, Burrard uh, Boulevard Bridge, to the other side of False Creek, where they were. When I got up to British Columbia, one of the things that I did that is just me, uh, especially having a fresh PhD in ecology, is I went to find out what kind of issues, environment issues they had, and I found out that the British Columbian uh, timber industry was much more destructive in its harvest of timber than those practices in the Western United, United States. And I realized that, that many people think that, you know, Canada is much better at these things. They're, um, perhaps they are politically, uh, you know, softer than we are and, and I guess kinder, but, um, not environmentally, they, the the uh, uh, the timber industry there harvest was at that time harvesting down right with no buffer zone on uh, uh, salmon bearing streams. They were clear cutting, um, burning, and um, and so I went w up to a um, a protest site that um, where they were starting the, the cutting of a very large area of forest in that way and uh, I camped with these people and there were different groups um, there were the much more radical sort of earth first groups and then there were the ones who I joined that were more to lodge the protest um, and on during this time camping up uh, in this area, I met a guy who invited me to go meet um, Finn Donnelly, who was going to was putting to, together an expedition called uh, the Spirit of Salmon, uh, and he was planning to swim the entire Fraser River, which is um, a thousand kilometer river that starts in eastern BC. It goes uh, north west it makes an upside down v it goes northwest up to what they call uh, you know the northern bc which when you look on a map it's actually south of the center um of bc but uh, up to i think it was prince philip uh and then it turns and heads uh southwest and flows down to vancouver and the Fraser River is the one of the few rivers that was not dammed. The Canadians, uh, fortunately, were you know thirty or forty years behind the Americans on the on putting in these enormous dams. And by the time they, uh, I, I guess, were just you know making the plans, it was the nineteen sixties. And, you know, there were too many objections to it. The, the ecology of the salmon was better known. And, and so they did not put a dam on that river. Uh, and there were something like seven species of salmon that uh, swam up that river and up its tributaries and creeks and then rivulets and uh, reproduced. And so I got onto this Spirit of Salmon expedition of two rafts and uh, with Finn Donnelly uh, swimming every day. And uh, it ended up being a great um, 
it was an entire month. And um, we camped at these places along the river. We would uh, do uh, as many miles as Finn could swim. And then we would uh, pull, pull over somewhere and camp, put up our tents. And um, we had, you know, cooking. We had food, set up camp and cook. And I cooked on some different nights and other people cooked. We took turns. There was one guy, it actually turned out to be the guy who recruited me, who, who, who was up in the, the forest protest. But this guy turned out to be just absolutely um, obnoxious and not, um, you know, just people just could not stand him, he, his behavior. And the thing about the Canadians is that um, it took them half, it took them two, two weeks to finally, uh, you know, I guess Finn Donnelly had to do it because he was the head of the expedition, but uh, to ask him to leave. And I know that Americans would have identified his um, sociopathology within three days and had him gone. And it kind of reminds me of, of that movie that uh, John um, Candy made, Canadian Bacon. And there's a scene where he runs down this grassy hill crowded with people standing up you know, to watch something, a speech or music or something. And he's running down the hill and he's, and he's elbowing these people and knocking them to the ground. And as they fall to the ground, <laughs> they all say, oh, excuse me, excuse me, sorry, sorry. <laughs> to Canada. I'm your worst nightmare. I don't know what you're talking about. We got ways of making you pronounce the letter O. And, you know, that's um, sort of represents that politeness and willingness of the Canadians to put up with all sorts of sociopathic behavior. After that great month on the Fraser River, I went back to Vancouver. I joined Elsa. I ran into a guy, uh, named uh, Michael Dean. I, I met him by going to the, an exposition of gardening and uh, all the techniques, especially organics um, and, and sustainable ways of doing gardening. And I went and I met this guy there and he had a small company uh, uh, fabricating uh, organic fertilizers. Um, and so he said, hey, why don't you come and work for me? So up I went to Grand Forks, British Columbia, and I had at, at, at that time a, a K car. And uh, there was, you know, it was a basic four-door sedan that could trunk with a trunk that could hold a huge amount of stuff if you didn't put it in boxes. I used bags for everything, clear plastic bags. And so off I went to BC to start working for this guy um, in formulating and putting together these organic fertilizer. The Deans were a typical family of three ki four kids three girls and a boy and um, typically sort of chaotic with all those kids at home they uh, liked to alternate homeschooling with um, with you know it, having the kids go uh, if they wanted to the public school uh, and I, I thought that was a pretty good idea because you know they stay at home for a whole year and then they want to be social and then they go to the public school and they get a big dose of all of that uh, public <laughs> culture and whatever it is click clickiness clannishness bullying uh, and whatever and then they do the next year uh, at home and of course Canada the Canada Canadian government has a homeschooling um, program that they they can get up the road from them was a woman by the name of Angie who had two kids uh, shy and then Angie's daughter I don't quite remember her name one of the things that happened was um, Michael used to get all kinds of uh, wild meat uh, up there they had bear they had cougar and these animals would be shot and skinned and um, slaughtered and butchered. Uh, and um, and he would he had, a, I think, three chest freezers. They'd, you know, they would come wrapped uh, with the cuts of meat wrapped, and occasionally he would eat, you know, bear meat or cougar or 
whatever uh, ungulate uh, happen to be, you know, deer or moose. Uh, and um, one time he, I wasn't there when that when this happened. It was it had happened before, but he said he, he when he went out to the one of the sheds where the chest freezers were, it was he smelled this terrible rotting smell. Turns out that someone had been out there rummaging around and had had dislodged the the plug uh, from the wall that went to the the chest freezer with oh gosh forty I must have been forty pounds of wild meats you know bear and cougar and all that and it probably went at least a month or two before the stench started uh, coming. Up. And Angie was sort of a, the woman up the road who was a back to the lander and she just made a living, you know, by just working occasionally. And so he would, Michael would, would delegate that kind of job to clean up that and, you know, get, clean it out and get rid of the stuff, bury it or whatever uh, to Angie. And uh, so when he uh, had his chickens, uh, he had chickens that were ready to be, uh, uh, slaughtered and butchered and frozen. Um, that's when I was there, so I helped Angie uh, pluck the uh, the carcasses of the chickens and get them into a uh, into a freezer. I can always tell when filming is done in British Columbia by looking at the background. Here you can see this is this is supposed to take place in Virginia, at Lakes twenty twenty three. And uh, of course, you can see it's just outside of Vancouver. You can see the snow-capped uh, mountains there and the forest. And one of the the well-known ones was uh, Jackie Chan's Rumble in the Bronx, that uh, was filmed in Vancouver because Vancouver has blighted uh, urban areas that can be uh, can you know be filmed as New York City. And you could see these snow-capped mountains in the background. Well, it turns out that his main customers were the well-known um, pot growers in BC. And at that time, BC was, was growing um, a lot of the pot that came down into the US, which had not been legalized yet either in either country, in, in any of the states. And so I connected with um, a pot grower and, and went to work uh, during the um, the growing season and then the harvest and what they call a trimming and I, I worked um, as a, a trimmer of the buds and it was it was pretty interesting I worked with a couple of guys who were real potheads and one one guy was like literally had the equivalent of a PhD in pot it was pretty hilarious he could he could draw graphs of indoor grown pot versus outdoor grown pot indica versus sativa and and how you know a graph of, of the high and how long it lasted and and the peaks and the lows and all that and and so we spent weeks um trimming and um this was out in in you know this the the, the grower had a place out in the uh uh you know sort of a in a rural area and so the the smell you know the drying when you after you harvest and you hang these things and then they would have a dehumidifier in there blowing out. Um, and it was very, very stinky, smelly, but it was rural enough. And plus, everybody, you know, in Canada kind of looked the other way, including the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Um, they didn't really want to disrupt this uh, economy um, and, unless they were forced to. And so, um, we did, uh, I think, a month every day of trimming the stuff, and these guys would, um, they would take all of the clippings, that, that was considered theirs, the buds belonged to the grower, which uh, after they were dry, well, they would, they would be dry when we trimmed them, and they'd put them into Ziploc bags and zip them up and very fancy, and you know, and, and um, these guys would take these, these, uh, po these cups of the trimmings, boxes of them you know little cigar boxes and then this guy would use this method of a um, a large uh, two liter soda pop bottle and a lighter fluid what was it called anyway um, and would make uh, finger hash 
from it. Um, and I, you know, I learned later it's it, you have to be pretty careful because you can blow your, blow things up. But anyway, that um, lighter that that fluid that was used in in lighters was used. And so he made that, and these guys would just smoke these huge, uh, these these huge spliffs. Afterwards, I would you know take a puff, but I just have never been that much into the pot. So this grower then um, said, "Okay, well, it's time to make our money." And so he hired a guy. Um, there was a guy who had done this before, to drive over to the hills that separated uh, British Columbia from Washington State, and it was only a few dozen, a few a few dozen miles. For exactly how much, but he would, but the 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 border, the U.S. Canadian border, would run at the top of the, and so he would, you know, put a hundred and ten, you know, pounds of of this, these bud bags into a pack and he hiked it up and then down the other side and had an arrangement sold it for a hundred and fifty thousand dollars or something and then uh, was driving back it actually was his I guess it was his vehicle and he was and he was supposed to go to a hotel because he had gone you know 24 or 36 hours without sleep he was supposed to go to a hotel and then sleep and arrange everything to, you know, to get these huge, uh, this sack of, of $20 and $100 bills over, uh, the, across the border, but, you know, driving. Actually, he was supposed to hike it over. He was supposed to hike, but he didn't. He was supposed to hike it over and he didn't. He drove. And our, the the Canadian Immigration Customs stopped him, got, had him get out, and they searched the car. They found the bag of money, uh, which is absolutely illegal. You have to declare, and you can't take any more than you know, say, ten thousand or something. And they confiscated it. And so I was living there uh, when I went over to the to the farmer's house, um, to the grower's house. I went in and he was sitting with his wife and his head was down and I hadn't, you know, I didn't have the news yet and he informed me what happened and he, it was just a loss for the entire year. And so he, um, and he said, I can't, he can't do anything about it. Later he told me he saw the guy who was caught in town and there's nothing he could do. And the guy was sorry, but there was nothing he could do. And so I was, I was not able to get any, you know, of the pay of the two thousand five hundred dollars or whatever it is uh, was. Um, but the guys who were working with me, they were hardcore, hard-nosed guy, and I know they got their money, uh, and uh, they weren't gonna, they weren't gonna take no. I had to, I had to leave uh, and go back to Vancouver. Uh, it was getting real cold. It was October. I saw my first northern lights in October there, driving at three in the morning uh, back from the uh, the trimming farm. And um, that was fun. Uh, it was something, uh, you know, a once in a lifetime experience because uh, it was cold enough. And that's when it happens. It's when it's really cold. And, you know, you just look to the north and you see this sort of curtain. And that in that case, it was this green curtain uh moving like a curtain being waved so anyway back to vancouver and uh you know back staying with the, you know with elsa we knew that we were separating um it was all in good terms uh and i got this call from bill liebhart who was a um professor at university of california davis just had just retired and he was asking me if I would go and do a postdoc, postdoctoral year with him at the Rodale Institute in Pennsylvania, where he had worked before. So I moved back to Vancouver West End with Elsa, and I um, one of the things I came to the realization that the the living there in those high quality. Uh, high-rise uh, apartments that you could buy, you could rent or buy, 
um, a really good way to live with a low environmental impact. You don't need a car because it's right down uh, in the urban area. Very often on the ground floor there are shops. You can walk a block or two to get everything you need. There's small hardware stores and things like that, cafes. And um, so I realized that it's really, uh, especially when there's a, a, you know, a small balcony um, with, you know, sliding glass doors and lots of light, uh, it's very high quality and, and well, you know, made well enough that you cannot hear the neighbor uh, playing their, you know, loud rock and roll music, you know, parquet floors, which are more soundproof than, you know, the regular the things like heating, water heating, and the uh, apartment heating were very efficient compared to single-family homes. Um, the water is all um, heated in um, a large tank. It's not even metered. It would just be, you know, it would be a waste of money to, to meter it. You can use as much hot water as you want. The hot water flows through pipes that warm the house. And this is, or the, the apartment, so this is pretty old technology, I mean, it's been around a long time. And I remember really well going uh, barely a year later uh, to Pennsylvania to my postdoc and looking for an apartment in Kutztown, which had a small college, Kutztown College, um, community college. And um, I remember going to this one older apartment that had um, a hot water system that ran down to the basement and I, w I wanted to look at it, and it had just in inconceivably, and this was typically Pennsylvanian compared to my you know, California culture, they had a hot water heater for each apartment, and the pipes going all the way down, and there were 20 different hot water heaters. The cost of putting all of that in instead of just having one big tank and not even bothering, and I just remember that typically, that that's just how those uh, Dutchy Pennsylvanians are and Dutchy means Deutsch. It's you know, and my ancestors were there. I'm you know, I have a German name, Lauter, and both sides of my family passed through there. Talk about that in the in the ancestors uh, chapter. But anyway, the the apartment living um, was really very uh, low environmental impact, and so I want to be on the record that I am a Yimby. Uh, as opposed to NIMBY, I'm a yes in my backyard. During this time in Vancouver, I did what I do so well. <laughs> and that is just spending time creating things. Uh, I was writing that paper about, that review paper on organics that had never been comprehensively done with all of the peer-reviewed research that I was able to access as well as the connect us idea of an internet website company that would connect people all over the world um, i just enjoy that process even if i don't <laughs> clearly looking back i don't think enough about um, my retirement and survival and all that uh, but i'm happy when i'm doing that i'm doing it now uh, in creating this memoir and it goes back, it goes all the way back to, you know, my undergraduate years, uh, time down in Latin America, and then graduate school, and the, the history of consciousness course, exploratory course, and the environmental earthware software, all that. So that's what I was doing. I just spent day after day doing that until I got the call from Bill Liebhardt. So I guess I'll just say, um, you know, follow your bliss. That's what I was doing. You may lose your shirt. I made sure I had no children to be responsible for. And that's a big deal. That's a big part of it, is making sure. Um, so I didn't have a mortgage to pay. I didn't have a child to support or children or wife to support. And so I was able to freely do those things without feeling, um, you know, the uh, any kind of guilt or, or the, 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 the was bothering me. And so I do recommend it, okay? If it makes you happy creating things and doing these things, um, 
and I would just say, take get the things taken care of that you really need to, like finishing, I guess, finishing university or um, making sure you don't get pregnant, uh, either man or woman. <laughs> and um, I tell, you know, I tell my students this, this was part of my teaching that, um, and it also, when you, when you enjoy learning things and creating, you also become a good, uh, a good teacher. These are the best teachers. And I think there's an underappreciation of that as well.